Well, good morning. Hope that you guys have had a great week. And uh, we're, I think these guys are making fun of me over here. Anyway, we're glad to have you. And we're going to be uh, having the kids come in for our second monthly Sing With The Kids time. So excited about that. And uh, as we get started, we're going to be singing this song, No Longer Slaves. I think it's always important for us to remind ourselves that as believers in Christ, we are no longer slaves to fear, but we are children of the Most High God. Amen? So whatever you might be uh, struggling with this morning, whatever thing might be weighing you down, let's lay that at the feet of the cross this morning. Remember that we are children of God. Let's stand as we sing. Unravel me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. God, I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child. chosen me your love has called my name I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to child of God. Nothing can change that. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, 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 oh. chorus one more time. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am 
the child of God. Lord, we do thank you, Lord, that for those of us who have called upon your name, God, we are no longer slaves to fear, slave to our sin, God, but we have been given a newness of life, a freedom in life as children of God. God, as your word says, we are bond servants to you, Lord. But Lord, in that, there is such freedom, such freedom from sin, such freedom from bondage, and what a new life and a new hope you give us. Help us to celebrate that in spirit and in truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. Hope all is well with you. Uh, glad to be back. Had a great time out. Uh, we were uh, with uh, we were at a conference at the church that we were at before we came here, uh, and uh, it was scheduled for April and it was rescheduled to September because of COVID. And so it was good to see family, good to see some familiar faces there and lifelong friends. And it was good to be able to brag about you and what God is doing in our church here. It's always good to be able to share about what God is doing here. Thankful to uh, Damon for covering a couple of weeks ago. And uh, for Pastor Jan, yeah, you can clap, that's right, you can clap for Damon, so take a bow, Damon, you can stand and take, and grateful for uh, Pastor Jan who shared last week, I know you were blessed by both of them. I uh, wanted to mention a few things, first of all, community groups start back this week, you should have received a blue bulletin insert a couple of weeks ago with the days, uh, locations, and times on, on that. Uh, if you did not receive that, there are a few hard copies out here in the hall that you can grab on your way out. Uh, it's not on our website simply because we don't want to put people's addresses since they meet in homes. Primarily, we don't want to put those on our website. So uh, if you go out here to get one of those sheets and it's not there, please let me know and we will get you all the information for our community groups to start back. Also want to let you know we have another group that was not published on there that is a unique group that's going to be meeting. Uh, they're going to be meeting every other Thursday. So, so a couple times a month, every other Thursday. They're going to start October 8th, and it's going to be at 6 o'clock. And what is unique about it, not only is meeting every other week, but also it's a family uh, community group, meaning that kids are welcome to be there with the adults and uh, just going to go with that model for that group. So I'm excited about that. If you would, again, that's not on the sheet, and it's not on our website. So if you would like some information about that family group, uh, that community group that's for, for families, come and talk to me, and I will be glad to get you the information for that time next year and we've got a new testament reading plan on our website under our resources part of our page uh, and also again hard copy out here in the hallway if you'd rather grab one of those uh, also family devotional time we challenged everyone in our church to do a weekly devotional together as a family uh, and again i know that is kind of terrifying to some probably to all of us but when i say family devotional time i'm not talking about stand with a podium and preach i'm talking about read a verse and talk about it as a family and pray together just something simple like that uh, and uh, to, to help with that, we've got a family devotional guide uh, that is available. It's going to be on our, it's on our website, under the, again, under the resources tab, and we also have a hard copy out in the hall if you'd like to grab one of those. One more thing I wanted to mention is uh, guest luncheon. If you are relatively new to our church and you would just like to get to know a little more about our church uh, and get to meet some, some of the leaders in our church, next Sunday after this service, we're going to have a free luncheon. Uh, that's going to take place here uh, in this big kids room back here so if you would like to be a part of that we just need to know so we can get account for food and there's a sign up sheet out in the hallway please let us know if you plan to be here for that uh, next week we are going to start a verse by verse study through the the old testament book of micah the old testament book of micah uh, so i would encourage you to possibly read that this week or at least read chapter one to familiarize yourself a bit with that book as we get started on that there's seven chapters in Micah, and so I'm thinking it'll take 14 or 15 weeks to get through that. I'm excited about that as we're starting a new school year, getting back to a sense of norm a sense of normalcy, as normal as it can be in the year 2020, right? I mean, this has been a very, very strange year, uh, but I'm excited about getting started back into that. Uh, I wanted to, before we pray, I want to read you some verses from Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says this. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. And I uh, just want to say this, no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what trials you're going through, no matter what burdens you brought into this room this morning, no matter the circumstances of your life, I think we would all agree that we have a lot to rejoice about, don't we? We have a lot to thank our great God for. God has been good to us. 
So Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all. The Lord is near. Now listen to verse 6, Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, what a great promise that is. That we have a God who loves us, who calls us, who bids us to come and to bring our burdens before Him. And we all, again, all have burdens this morning. So whatever it is that is on your heart this morning, the best thing we can do is pray and lay that at the altar and say, God, give me peace. Guard my heart, guard my mind in this. Uh, I want to do something a little bit different this morning. This has kind of was, been on my heart the last few days to do this morning. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of people in our church right now who are sick. Uh, I got permission to share this, but a lot of you guys know Vern Hintz, who is one of our greeters up front. Uh, Friday morning, Vern went in for uh, just a basic heart check, and uh, they found some very concerning things there. And long story short, went in Friday morning for that check. Saturday morning, he had to have triple bypass surgery. Um, and he's doing great. Got a text from Leanne this morning. He is doing really, really well in recovery. But we want to pray for, for Vern and Leanne. It's going to be a you know, six or eight week recovery for him. So we want to pray for them. We've got another lady. I'm not going to share her name. But she recently was diagnosed with, uh, with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she is going through treatments now. And she is in isolation currently. We want to pray for her. Pray for her husband. Um, and then there are others who just have some general illness that uh, just seems a little bit, seems like there's a lot of sickness right now. And we want to pray for all of those and their families. Uh, also, I've, I've kind of noticed that there are some relational difficulties that have occurred recently in several of our marriages and just some of our friendships and so forth, and I want to pray for that, uh, pray for them, uh, and also just for those who are struggling right now with the future. Uh, you know, the election year, about that, and, and so we want to be sensitive to that, and we want to pray for those things. So what I want to do differently this morning, and I don't want to single anyone out, I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable during this time, but I just feel led for us to do this today. Um, if, if you are physically able and if you are willing, I want to do something a little different. I'm going to ask you to stand and just kneel in your seat right now. And we're just going to kneel down before God and just going to lift these prayer requests before him. So again, I don't want to single one out, but if you're able and willing, I would invite you to do that right now. And we have greeters if you need help up after this is over. We can certainly come and, and do that as well. Father, right now we come before you in the name of Jesus, so thankful for the ability to assemble here today. God, we thank you for the reality that we can come into a relationship with you because of the great sacrifice of Christ. God, this morning there are so many burdens that we are carrying today, so many things in our lives that, that, that others know about and some that others don't know about, just unspoken in our heart, areas of concern. God, right now, we pray for those in this body of faith who are sick. First of all, I thank you for Vern and Leanne and their friendship. I thank you for their love for you, their desire to serve others. And Lord, I thank you for our medical professionals today who were able to find this issue and able to do the surgery necessary to get him on the road to recovery, God. And we pray for that road. We pray that it would be quick. We pray that, uh, Lord, you would, that he would have minimal pain along the way, God, and that this church would come alongside them to help them these next few weeks. God, I thank you for them. Thank you for, for, for uh, the, the work that was done on him. Lord, we pray for this dear sister in our church who is going through cancer right now. Lord, we pray right now for healing. God, we know, we know that you are able, and God, we pray to that end that you would do a miraculous, supernatural work on her body, even right now, God, to bring about healing. God, we pray for her family right now, her husband, as he is caring for her, that you would give him great strength, that you would give him peace uh, and, and, and her whole family in this. Lord, we pray for others who are sick right now, God, that you would be with them, that you would bring healing into their lives. Lord, we pray for those relationships that are hurting right now, for marriages that are, that are struggling right now. God, I pray for each of those involved, Lord, that they would both have the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ. They would understand that the gospel is what they need to look to, God. They need to understand the reality of agape love, of self-sacrificing love, that they would defer to the other, that there would be reconciliation, God. We pray that in our marriages. We pray that in our friendships. We pray that in our relationships with others in our family. 
God, we pray for those right now who are struggling for the future, who are struggling about the future, who are, uh, Lord, who are worried about this election coming up. God, we understand and we know biblically that it is all in your control, God, and that you are sovereign over the affairs of men. But God, we also know that there are consequences and there are, there are we're, we're, in some cases, we're, we're, some are worried about what's going to happen here in November. And so God, we just pray for peace. And Lord, we pray that our eyes would be opened up and our hearts would understand the supernatural reality that you truly are sovereign, that you truly are in control. And God, I pray that we would trust you in that. Lord, I pray right now for those who are really, really struggling with anxiety about this virus. Lord, I pray for those who are at high risk, God, that they would take those extra precautions, God, and that they would be wise, that we would all be wise in the midst of this. But Lord, I pray for those who have a very unhealthy fear of this. God, that they would not be gripped by that, that they would know that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And so, God, I just pray for the end of this virus, Lord. We pray that we would not be afraid, that we would know again that you're in control of all things, God, and that you rule and you reign. God, this morning as we open up your word, as we think deeply about the gospel, as we think about what you have done in our lives, God, I pray that our hearts would well up in worship this morning. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this body of faith. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Ashton. Amen. If the kids are ready to come in, bring it on. I don't, there's Susie. Hey. Oh, she just went by. Okay, cool. <laughs> We're ready. Welcome. Yay. All right, let's all stand together. We're going to join as one church from the youngest to the oldest in this room. We want to remember God's presence is here in this place with us and wherever we go. Amen. 
let's get a shout of praise the Lord. He is good.
again. Lord, you are so good. You are such a good, good father to us. Lord, in you, as we've sung, we are a new creation. God, despite the things that we still encounter in this life, because we live in a fallen world, God, we can always declare that we are blessed. God, we are healed from the, the bondage, from the death that we owed in our sin. God, we are saved by the power of Jesus' name. God, I pray that from every generation represented in this room, that we would have that understanding in our hearts, that you love us so much, that you're so, so good to us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before the kids leave, all right, who can tell me? You can be seated, except for the kids. <laughs> Need to get their energy out. All right, quickly. Who can tell me the first four books of the New Testament? Say it. New Testament. There you go. Okay. Sorry, I'm out of candy. That's it. Last question. <laughs> the only question I have. But if I had said Old Testament, you would have got it, but good try. Okay. You guys can leave. It is remarkable to me how many blonde-haired, blue-eyed kids there are around here. This is the response I often get at home to, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you guys can head on out. <laughs> All right, it's neat to have them in here every now and then, isn't just to see the kids singing and clapping and uh, you know, there's something that is very, very beautiful to me. I, I always stand in the back during the singing time for a couple of reasons. One, some of you probably won't believe this, but truly, I really am just naturally, I'm, I'm an introverted person. I just kind of like being in the back. Uh, but another thing I like about being back there is it is a beautiful thing to look out and just to see God's people worshiping Him. And look out and see hands lifted, singing, God, you are so good. God, you have been so good to me. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you are a Christian... I want you to think for a minute about the circumstances surrounding your salvation. When you came to know Christ, maybe you were at a bad place in life. Maybe there were trials and circumstances in your life at that time that just kind of, you had, kind of had you in a really, really dark place in life. Maybe you were at a really good place in life and things were at peace. Maybe, maybe you were raised in a re very religious home. You were at church every Sunday and every Wednesday. Or maybe you were raised in an irreligious home. Maybe even in a home that, that hated all things Christian. Hated God that talked openly about their disdain for God. Maybe you had a terribly rough upbringing where you experienced a lot of abuse and trauma. And for many, many years you were embittered toward God. Or maybe you grew up in a great family and had a great life. We all have different stories, but if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is good to remember, to regularly remember how we were saved, what the circumstances surrounding our salvation, remember what happened. As a pastor, I often have to go back to my calling to ministry. There are times in ministry, majority of the time is joyful, and, and it, is, it is just something I absolutely love doing. But then there are weeks and days that are difficult, and you sense the burden of the church and people in the church, and it can become very, very heavy. And there are times that I have to go back to when I was 19 years old and when I clearly remember God calling me into gospel ministry. And it is the same with our salvation, regardless of of whether or not things are going well or not so well in our lives today. When things are bad, when things aren't going well, it's tempting to despair. And when things are going great, it is tempting to become arrogant or complacent or self-sufficient. So today we're going to look at a passage that I love. We're between studies, as I said, we're going to start the book of Micah next week. Uh, and we just finished up our, some other studies that we've been doing over the summer and so this week is a freebie for me. I get to pick what I want to do this week, which I'll be honest with you, one of the reasons I love going through books of the Bible is I'm awful at picking what I want to do. It takes me forever to figure out what it is. I'll think I'm going to, I had like four different sermons ready for this, and then today, I, or not today, but a couple days ago, I settled on this one 
today. And so typically what I do when I have a free week is I just go back and, and usually preach from a book of the Bible that I love. And I've got several that I really, really like. Some of my, as you do, some of your top and your favorite books of the Bible, I have mine as well. And one of mine, possibly my favorite, is the book of Colossians. We preached through this several years ago. And so if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. It is, as I said a moment ago, a good practice to regularly go back to the simplicity of the gospel. And these verses in Colossians present the gospel very clearly. As you all know, we have been and we are living in a very, very strange day in the year 2020. There are words I would use to describe it strange, weird, odd. There might be other descriptors you would use. But my goal today is twofold in this message. Number one, for those who are children of God, if you know Christ... When I ask you to remember your salvation, if you, can, if you can think back on a time or a season in your life where you began to really love God, you begin to walk with God, you trusted in Him, you asked Him to forgive you of your sins. If you are a Christian, one of my goals today is that you would leave here worshiping God more deeply and more profoundly as a result of this message. Thankful for your salvation. The second part is this. I want to call any who may be here today or watching online who don't have a relationship with God, I want to call you into a relationship with God. I want to to present the gospel in such a way that God uses it in your life to draw you to salvation, to help you understand your need for Christ. So look at Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 12, first of all. Colossians 1, 12. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. How have we been qualified to have an inheritance in God's kingdom and in God's family? How have we been qualified? qualified what makes us sufficient for this look at verse 13 for or because he rescued us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins so there are two parts to verse 13 he rescued us and he transferred us now, what does it mean, first of all, that Christians, if you know Christ, you have been rescued by God? What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that something was terribly wrong in our lives that caused us to need to be rescued. A person who needs rescuing is a person of great need. And in mankind's case, all of us, we were stuck in the wrong kingdom before we came to know Christ. We were held there as hostages by our own lusts by our sin, without hope, without the ability to break the shackles of sin, without the ability to avoid the consequences of our sin. But then God did something magnificent to rescue us. At the appropriate season of God's sovereign timing, God sent forth His Son Jesus into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen to Galatians 4, 4 through 4-7. It says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Think of that picture, adoption into God's family, fatherless, adopted. We have a father, we have a family through Christ. Because you are sons, Paul writes in Galatians, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. An heir to what? An eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance through what Christ has done. God has qualified us for that. He has made us sufficient for that by making us holy through Christ's holiness that is imputed to us, that is given to us when we embrace Christ as our Lord. It says here He rescues us at that point. The word for rescue used in Colossians 1.13 here is a word that means to draw to oneself. It's the picture of someone needing rescue and someone grabbing them and pulling them into safety, pulling them to their arms to safety. The idea is that God has rescued us by bringing us to Himself. And He has done so in the most remarkable, the most sacrificial way there is. He made it possible by the cross. That's why Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I, if I am lifted up, picture of the cross, if I am lifted up, I will draw men to Myself. It is through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, that man can be saved. Jesus on the cross, in my place, for my sins. When we trust in Him, when we believe, when we repent, we are saved. We are saved. Now, that word saved is a very churchy word. It's a good word. It's a biblical word. But if we go up to someone out in the street and say, are you saved? What are they going to say? Saved from what? 
I think I'm safe right now. What, am I need to, what do I need to be saved from? Spiritually, we need to be saved from our sin. We need to be saved from the just judgment of God because of our sin. And here Paul says that we also are saved when we trust in God and rescued from the domain of darkness. We're rescued from the domain of darkness. What is the domain of darkness that Paul writes of here in Colossians 1? The word domain means control or authority. So when, when a person places their faith in Christ's atoning work, God rescues us or God delivers us from the power of darkness that previously had full control over our lives. Certainly one of, I believe, the greatest pictures of being taken from, from darkness and into light, I think it's one of the greatest in the Bible, is found in Mark chapter 5. If you, if you will, flip over to Mark chapter 5. Hold your place here in Colossians and flip over to Mark chapter 5. There's a, a story here that I think really sums up. It's a great picture of what it means to be taken from death to life, darkness to light. Mark chapter 5. Verse 1, it says they, this is Jesus and his disciples, they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs, this is a man who lived in a cemetery. That's not normal, right? I mean, that's not normal. Immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And listen to this, he had freakishly supernatural strength. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. So there was this man who was possessed by devils. And he was powerful because of that. And people feared him. People wanted to keep him away from their city, from their children. So they would, they would tie him up. They would bind him in chains. And this man, because of these demonic spirits, would break the chains. Verse 5, constantly, constantly night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. This was a man who was tormented. Night and day, no rest no freedom from these spirits. And these spirits told him to hate himself, to cut himself, which, by the way, happens a lot today, too, and I believe there's demonic influence in that. Verse 6, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up, bowed down before him, and shouting with a loud voice that we can only imagine would be shrieks and demonic sounding. He said, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out, of you, come out of this man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And this man said to Jesus, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out into the country, out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank of the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen ran away, as I probably would have. <laughs> ran away and reported in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. So get the picture here. This is a man who has been wrecked, a man who has been ruined by these demonic spirits. We don't know what he did to open himself up to these spirits, but at some point he did. They entered him, and this man was ruined. This man was broken. This man was tormented. People feared him. People wanted nothing to do with him. They just wanted him to stay away, and he encounters Christ. Jesus cast these unclean spirits out. Look at verse 15. They came to Jesus, and look at this. They observed the man who had been demon-possessed. And look at his state now, sitting down, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. That is a great picture of someone literally being taken from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, this is just a good reminder that when we are delivered from one kingdom into the next it does not mean that we're not going to battle sin anymore in our lives we live in a fallen world we live in fallen bodies we have conflict with each other when we come to know christ doesn't mean everything's going to be great it doesn't mean we're not going to sin anymore 
Now, we should be striving against that, and we should be growing in our faith to where sin is becoming less and less in our lives. But Paul wrote, think about the Apostle Paul, one of the most godly men. I mean, certainly up there toward the top, we would think of. And Paul even wrote in Romans chapter 7 about this very thing. He wrote of his continued struggle with sin and mankind's continued struggle with sin. I think about John Newton, the author of the old hymn, Amazing Grace. He said this, he said, I am not the man I ought to be. I'm not the man I even wish to be, and I'm not the man I hope to be, but by the grace of God, I am not the man I used to be. Isn't that a great quote? We are who we are because of what God has done in our lives, the grace of God, and we are growing, we are to be growing, we are to be sanctified, we are to be growing in our faith. Here's what happens. This is from an old preacher by the name of Adrian Rogers. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. He passed away some years back. But he said, talking about salvation, he said, the moment you repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord, you are saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. You are declared righteous in the sight of God. After that, he said, you enter a process of sanctification where you are being saved from the power of sin. Sanctification, growing in godliness. And then he said, when you get to heaven, when you die and go to heaven, you will be saved then from the very presence of sin. Penalty of sin, power of sin, and the presence of sin. The idea there is justification, sanctification, glorification. When you know Christ, you have been, the Bible talks about it this way, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now let me just stop for a minute and ask you this question. It's a question we often forget about in our Christianity as we grow, but does that amaze you still? Does that amaze you? Do you marvel at the old hymn, the matchless grace of Jesus, wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus? It is so easy to get sophisticated in our Christianity that we forget of the beauty and the profound simplicity of the message of life. Those who know Christ have been rescued, he says, from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Related to that, here are some other things we need to remember. People... People don't naturally understand that they are in darkness. According to Romans chapter 3, verse 11, it says, there is, none, there is none who seeks God. God's Spirit has to work in a person's heart for them to realize their need for Christ. Man's spiritual eyes have to be opened up. We didn't realize we needed Christ before we came into His kingdom. I mean, think about what led you to that point. There came a distinct point where, for some reason, there was a light bulb. And I know what that reason was. It was the Spirit of God working in your heart. But there came a point where you had probably heard the message of Christ many other times and nothing. But then there was that time where you heard it and God opened up your eyes. You knew your lostness. You knew your need and you trusted in Christ. Someone, again, the, the, the circumstances surrounding that might be different for all of us. Someone might have come up to you out on the street and shared the message with you. And God gripped your heart and saved you. Or maybe for whatever reason you were reading the Bible. Maybe you were on Facebook or so, another social media platform and you saw someone put up a Bible verse and you didn't know anything about it, but it was an encouraging verse. So you said, let me dust off my old Bible and look at those verses. And you began to read and God began to open up your eyes and God gripped your heart and you knew you needed him. Or maybe you turned on the radio or another media platform and you heard the message of Christ. It might have happened over months. It might have happened over years. But there was a point during one of those encounters with the message of the gospel where the spirit of God worked in concert with the word of God to open up your eyes, to enlighten you, to understand your need for him. And you then trusted in him repented of your sins, bowed your life before Him. That's how salvation occurs. That's how rescue from the authority of darkness happens. Now, what does it mean here that God has transferred, his, transferred believers into His kingdom? He's rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. What does that mean? Colossians 1.13, what, what does it mean He has transferred us into His kingdom? The word for transfer here means to cause a change of state. It speaks of transformation. And in the context of what Paul is writing here, it means spiritually transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. You have a new home. You have a new family. You have a new life. Experience, verse 14. Look at verse 14. You have then experienced redemption. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You have been, at that point, redeemed by God. We love stories of redemption, don't we? We love stories of the underdog, someone who messed up and they've disappointed a lot and later they redeem themselves. Maybe it's during a sporting event where someone early in the season 
makes a boneheaded play. They cost their team the game. Everyone is down on them. Everyone is angry with them. And then later in the season, when the stakes are even higher, they step up and they make a play and they redeem themselves. Their team wins. That is a redemption story. That's how we often think of of redemption. But what is the redemption that is being spoken of here, that we have redemption through Christ? Does, Does that mean the same thing? Does it mean that we made our past wrongs right? Does it mean that we fixed our own spiritual condition through our own awesome efforts? What does redemption mean here in verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins? The word redemption here is an interesting word. It means to let a person go free by means of a ransom, specifically. To let a person go free by means of a ransom. So this redemption that we have in Christ is something that is completely out of our hands. In other words, we can't do enough good to redeem ourselves spiritually. We can't, we can't, it's not a balancing scale where if we can just do more good than bad, then we will redeem ourselves, we will save ourselves, and we will be right with God. It is completely out of our hands. I mean, think about what a ransom is. If someone is kidnapped, the bad guy might contact the family and, and they'll say, look, I'll give you your, your, your loved one back if you give me this amount of money. Think about it from a perspective of a nation. If a person is kidnapped or they're taken captive in a foreign land the captor might contact that nation the person is from and demand a ransom give me a million dollars i'll give you your citizen back that's a ransom in god's kingdom the bible is very clear a ransom has been paid for us a ransom has been paid and with that ransom there is a release of those who choose to be rescued by god you know in the united states we have a no ransom policy if one of our citizens It's taken hostage. We don't offer ransoms because we know that if we do that, then more citizens will probably be kidnapped so that bad guys can get money from our nation. We don't want to empower and embolden the enemy, so we have a no-ransom policy. So why does God then pay a ransom when we too have an enemy? Here's the difference. In Jesus' ransom payment, He not only liberates those who choose to be rescued, but in that ransom payment, he permanently and eternally defeated the enemy, the very one who wants to keep us in shackles. And this crushing defeat of Satan was prophesied in many places throughout the Bible, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, immediately after the fall of man. Listen, Satan is defeated. Do you believe that? Satan is defeated. And so here's my problem with what's happening in our world today. We have so many people that are terrified about the election coming up. They're terrified about where our nation is or where our world is, or they have so many different fears. And we must never forget that we are on the winning team. Christ rules and He reigns in sovereign power. He is in charge. And we don't have to fear. He is one. Genesis chapter 3 says He's going to crush the head of the serpent. And it was on that hill of Golgotha, the place of the skull, where Jesus permanently defeated Satan. He destroyed him. He crushed his head. I've shared this story before that I heard a long time ago about a, this was not my first sermon. I'm getting way off topic here, and this is always scary when I do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. You've probably heard this illustration I've shared before. It's not original to me, but I heard of a, uh, a missionary who moved to South America, and they were living in this hut, and it was just built on, on stilts. And they, they had gone out for the day, and when they came back, they opened the door, and inside was this massive snake, 13, 14-foot snake. So they opened the door, they closed the door, and they got out of there, as any sane person would do. And they went and found some of the villagers and said, hey, there's a big problem, literally a big problem in our house. And so one of the villagers went in there and looked in the window, and they said, that's the biggest snake we've ever seen. So one of the villagers, fortunately, had a rifle. And they went and got that rifle, and they put it in that window there, and they shot that serpent in the head and all who were gathered there said it was the most remarkable thing said the whole building began to shake as that snake just you know kicked around and flopped around and broke stuff you could hear stuff falling over in there and then this pastor this illustration said that is a great illustration of satan he is a defeated foe but while he is a christ has paid our debt christ has paid our debt All right, I don't know where I am now in my sermon, but anyhow, I'll get off topic and then I get lost in my notes. The idea of redemption that is spoken of here in verse 14 is that we have been set free by the payment of another. It's the picture of someone paying for our freedom, paid for by Christ. And we know that we've not only 
been bought off of the slave block of sin, but another remarkable spiritual thing happens when we are rescued by God. At that point, we're not only transferred into a different kingdom, the kingdom of God, we are adopted into God's family. And here's the result of redemption and adoption that we can have through Jesus. We can have the forgiveness of sins. That's what he says here, redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Our past sins, our present sins, our future sins washed away when we trust in Christ. As far as the east is from the west, we go from death to new life. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, behold, new has come. We go from being lost to found in Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. When we trust in Christ, we go from judgment to grace. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We go from having the wrath, the rightful wrath of God resting on us because of our sin to having the mercy of God lavished on us through Christ. We go from bondage to freedom. Jesus said, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. We go from fatherlessness to having an eternal father. And do not lose sight of how all, all this is made possible. The most important thing, the very center of the gospel, the very center of the Christian message, the message of Christ, this is different than any other message that is out there today, any other religion today. Jesus not only made the ransom payment for our sins, he was the ransom payment. He willingly laid down his life. He was the priest who sacrificed himself on our behalf. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, written over 700 years before Christ would go to the cross. Prophecy about Christ, it says, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus on the cross, in our place, beaten, beaten with rods, beaten with whips, beaten with fists, spit on, mocked, a crown of thorns put on his head, hung on a rugged old cross for our redemption, Christ in our place, paying our ransom debt. You know, one of the grave errors I believe that many people fall into when they read the Bible is they, they go to the Bible looking for affirmation of how awesome they are, right? We say, man, I'm, just, I'm really discouraged right now. I need to read the Bible and just find out how awesome I am. And certainly, that is not a bad thing to do periodically. It is good to do that. It's good to look at the Word of God and understand that we are God's special creation, created in the image of God. God loved us enough to send His Son to die for us to understand how valued we are to be able to be made right with god that is good but listen these verses in colossians and the whole of the bible is not about how awesome we are it is about how awesome and great our god is that's what this is about that's what this is about jesus himself on the cross ransom payment for our sin now one more thing this makes it so remarkable look at colossians 1 again look at verse 15 colossians 1 15 it says it describes this one who died for us he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, that's not saying he was born into creation as if he didn't have a, as if he had a starting point. The Bible is very clear, Christ is eternal. In fact, the very next verse backs that up, verse 16, for or because by him all things were created. So when it says firstborn of creation, it means he is the creator, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, place in everything. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Here's what that means. It means that, you think about who this God is. Think about what Christ has done. What is the only natural response, the only appropriate response to a God like this? Paul says he's got to have first place in every area of our lives. No other gods before him. Whatever, and, and, and listen, maybe today you are here and you do know Christ. But maybe if you're very honest, you would say there are things in my life. It might be a person. It might be a child. It might be a spouse. Lives. He's to have first place. Verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things are creator, the ruler, the sustainer of his creation, the joy and the reason for life, the head of the church, the conquering one, the preeminent one, God incarnate, this is the one who willingly gave himself for you and for me. 
so that we can have life. By placing our faith in what Christ has done, by simply calling out to Him, asking Him to forgive us of our sins, by repenting of our sins, turning from them, by surrendering our lives to Christ, we can be saved. We can be forgiven. I ask you to, when I ask you to think back on your salvation, maybe if you're very honest, you would say, I really couldn't. I, don't, I can't remember a time in my life where I've repented of my sins, where I've trusted in Christ. Well, I believe today you have clearly heard the message of Christ. You've clearly heard how you can be saved, how you can be rescued, how you can be delivered and transferred into God's kingdom, adopted into his family. If you've never trusted in Christ, do not reject that today. There's a warning in lots of different places, but I want to read one right now, Hebrews 4.2. It says, For indeed we have had the good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Jesus told a parable about this, a parable of the sower. If you have had the word of God come to you this morning, the gospel is in your heart right now, do not allow Satan to come in and steal away that seed. Allow it to grow. Repent of your sins. Trust in Christ this morning. Don't squander this opportunity that God has laid before you. Second thing is this. If you know Christ this morning, all I want you to do is just worship God in your heart. In a moment when we're quiet, I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up now. And in a moment as they're playing, as we're all quiet and thinking and contemplating, just worship God in your heart. Say, Lord, you have been good to me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for saving me. I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. We knelt down earlier to pray, which was different, so might as well do something different here at the end of the service as well. And here, I invite Jesus Christ. Come and see me here in a minute, and, and we would love to, to connect you with someone who can share the message of Christ with you, or, or if there's just a burden on your heart, and you just want to pray, I'd love to pray with you this morning, so come. bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you another question. If maybe right now you do have a lot of things going on in your heart, some burdens you have brought into this room this morning, and you would just like some general prayer for that right now, I would just ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to pray for you. Opportunities to come together on Sundays and Wednesdays and, and other times, God, and just encourage one another. So, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now who are struggling through different areas of their lives. And, Lord, I think to an extent all of us have these burdens in our hearts. So, God, just help us. Encourage us. Lord, we know your word says that the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in us, who know you, he is our helper. He is our advocate. He is our parakletos, the one who comes alongside us in life to help us. So, God, encourage. Holy Spirit of God, encourage. Lord, as your word says, for those of us who just are hurting right now over things and they don't know how to pray, Lord, we pray to the Holy Spirit right now to pray for us, to encourage us, to give us wisdom. Father, if there's anyone here this morning or watching online who doesn't know you, God, we pray that they would be saved today. Father, help us to leave here this morning with hearts full, hearts full of your grace and your love. Lord, as we take up this challenge of reading through the New Testament by this time next year, God, I pray as we do. Lord, each day, Lord, we would not overwork, try and do everything on our own, but we would overflow. Overflow with your grace and your goodness in our lives and in the lives of those we come in contact with. Thank you for your love and grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to stand. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's worship God together before we go. And great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not.
Jesus.